first, first talk and someone asked, so come on, is this stuff real? Or are these lasers, can you really keep time with lasers? So that, well, okay, on, on paper at least, it's still running, right? <laughs> Not so bad. <laughs> I'll come back to that question though. That was a good question. And um, today you'll get a little bit of flavor of how real some of these systems are and then tomorrow even more of that. So, so I think this is where we, we ended up was this kind of concept of the pulse circulating in the cavity and what the snapshot of the electric field would look like in time and how the Fourier transform um, gives this uh, frequency comb. So, so I didn't, Roy did a good job preparing questions and putting them on a slide. So I'll, I'll use this to ask one question maybe you want to think about, is what, what determines the, the line width of those comb teeth? Okay, so maybe that's something you can think about as we go through this. So, so let's, let's dig in here deeper, okay? So, so here's a nice animation that maybe gives you a little bit of a flavor of, of what's going on with the propagation in the cavity. My, my colleague Steve Cundiff made this, and we'll just watch it here. What you're, what you're looking at is a simulation of a pulse circulating in a laser cavity. So this would be a high reflector. Here's the output coupler. And you see now this, this carrier, what's imagined here is there's uniform dispersion in this cavity, okay? Maybe it's just air. But you see the carrier envelope phase evolving. And then when a pulse comes out, it's got a fixed carrier envelope phase there, right? And then let's see what happens when the next one comes out. And I think the animation stops there. But you see now at some different point, there was a, as the pulse circulated, now the carrier envelope phase is a different value after the next round trip. So it's the change from one to the next that is this, this delta phi that I'd shown in the previous slide, okay? So, so how could you measure that? And, and let's just bounce back once again to remind ourselves that this, so what we were looking at is two successive pulses, right, that came out of the cavity and they had this delta phi, the carrier envelope phase advanced from one pulse to the next. And, and remember I told you that that is related to the frequency domain, this, this offset frequency. So the offset frequency turns out to be really important, right? So we, because if we had no offset frequency, right, then the optical frequency would just be a harmonic of the repetition rate. And anyone can measure the repetition rate. You just detect the rate at which pulses come out of the laser. You multiply by a big number and you would have an optical frequency. The game would have been over in 1964, okay? But this offset frequency is an, addition, is an additive term, a constant factor. So, so if we're going to measure, make measurements with this frequency comb, we have to be able to measure and control the offset frequency. And that means that we also get some measurement and control of that pulse-to-pulse -pulse phase slip, carry envelope phase slip. So, so how could we measure that? Well, here, here's an experiment we did very early on where, where we actually did measure the, the carrier envelope phase shift directly in the time domain. And we did that with a cross correlator. So this is a, a little bit of a detailed slide, but, but what you're looking at is the, imagine those pulses you saw on the previous slide, okay? They're input into this device where in one arm we have some sort of an optical arrangement to give some delay, and in the other arm we have a big delay, 20 nanoseconds or two cavity round trip, um, two cavity round trip times. So we take the pulse in, we split it, and in this arm of the interferometer, we store the pulse for two cavity round trip times, so that then the two pulse times later, a pulse that comes in is going to interfere with the output of this delay. So we're taking pulse n and interfering it with n plus two. Okay. And we do that in a, in a nonlinear type of scheme. Roy showed you these autocorrelations. This is a cross-correlation. Right? He also showed some cross-correlations, I believe, as well. But this is a type of cross-correlator where we also resolve the relative phase between the two fields. So the output of this would look like a signal like that, where you, you see the cross-correlation between the pulse n and pulse n plus 2 in that case. 
And then what we did is we would, we would fit this cross-correlation. So you'd take an, fit uh, the envelope as well as the oscillations under the, under the envelope. And here I'm just showing the, the region in the very center. And we would look for any small offset between the peak of the, of the oscillation and the peak of the envelope. To do this well, you, you need pretty short pulses. In this case, they were about 10, 15 femtosecond pulses at 800 nanometers. But it, it, of course, you have a hard time doing that measurement if the pulse is a picosecond, right? There'd be, this would just look flat. So where's the real peak? So we, we made measurements of this delta phi while we fixed this, this ratio. Remember, here's the expression I gave you for delta phi. It's the ratio of the offset frequency to the repetition rate. We could control the laser, and I'll, I'll show you how we did that in a little bit, but we could fix this ratio and then measure delta phi, and we could in fact see that as we change the ratio, F0 to F rep, and here, here I apologize, the notation's a little different. It's delta over F rep. Here I called it F0. But we could see this, this linear relationship with the, with the correct slope. And there's a 4 here instead of a 2 because we were delaying pulse not n and n plus 1, but n and n plus 2. But it, it fit exactly what we'd expect. And so we could verify from a time domain measurement that there really was a connection between the carrier envelope offset frequency, or, or the pulse-to-pulse -pulse phase slip, and this carrier envelope offset frequency, F0. So I, that's the last kind of time domain data I'm going to show you. Well, well, maybe there'll be something here and there. But, but this was just kind of an interesting illustrative experiment to show that there really is this connection between the, the time and frequency domains for these parameters. So let's come back to the, to the frequency comb and just think a little bit more about um, you know, how this mode picture evolves, is built up, and what that means in time and frequency domain again. So, so you know, a very simple way to think about this is that the, a laser cavity, and here I just draw it as two mirrors, you know, the, the, the resonant modes of that cavity are just those frequencies or those wavelengths for which a half integer number of wavelengths fits in the cavity. So here I attempted to draw that for different colors. So for a, for a fixed length of the cavity, you get more wavelengths or more cycles in the cavity than for a, a, a red wavelength. And if, if the phase of these waves in the cavity are all fixed, if they're locked in phase, and that's what mode locking means, then they all add up at a certain time to give a short pulse. So this is a very simple picture of how, how a, a mode lock laser works. And in fact, it's, it's those modes, and, and here, I, just so you could see them, I, I displace them vertically in the cavity, right? In a real laser, all of these are together, and that's what makes the beam of your laser. We don't spread out the different colors, or usually we don't do that in a laser. But, but these, each color is then a mode of our frequency comb, okay? So there's, there's a simple picture. But, but how does it really work, okay? So there, there must be something more to that. And, and if I were to give you the full explanation, it would be a big, longer, big long description of how femtosecond lasers work. But just briefly, let's talk about, about some of the, the key components, OK? Any kind of femtosecond laser has these, these elements. It has a laser cavity, OK? We saw that. It has some mirrors. It has a broadband gain source. If we want to make short pulses, Okay, usually we need broad spectral bandwidth. Okay, Roy gave a little, a little brain teaser on that. He was proposing maybe there's a way you can have short pulses with less bandwidth, so you'll have to think about that. But generally speaking, if you want to have sh something short in the time domain, you need broad spectral bandwidth. Okay, and you need some optical components. You need some mirrors and, and you know, focusing elements and things like that. And, and these optical components have to support the, the broad gain bandwidth. But, but things you, you've heard about now in the past couple days, I highlight here in blue, to make these lasers work, you need dispersion control. You need, you need to know something about what has been called beta, OK? You need power-dependent gain or loss. This relates to, to the N2I. And, and the way that usually comes about in these lasers 
And we heard about that past few days is, is this process called self-focusing, where the intensity, the radial distribution of the intensity in a dielectric medium gives you the effect of a lens. And so the cavity can be designed in such a way that it's more stable for high intensity operation than for low intensity. And that, that tends to favor short pulses in the cavity. So, so all of these things you learned about, I won't go into the details, but, but they, they play very critically into the formation of a, of a frequency cone. The other aspect, the other thing we need is phase modulation. And that's, that's just the, the time domain picture of, of the, the Kerr effect, the Kerr lens, OK? So it, the, this Kerr lens has an effect in space, but it also has an effect in time. And, and that's what Roy explained nicely in, in his talk is this phase modulation. The phase modulation acts to not only generate new colors, but it acts to, to compensate for dispersion or, um, in the cavity as well. So let's, let's this, this picture I showed on this previous slide, you know, a simple laser cavity. OK, here I provide some curved mirrors to track the light in the cavity. If we just very first principle said, well, what would be the mode spacing of this cavity? It's just C over 2L, right? It's the speed of light divided by twice the length. So if we, if we drew those modes here on this frequency axis, we would find that the ideal cavity modes, I, I tried to draw them as dash lines here, they would be perfectly spaced, OK? And that's just C, they're spaced by two, C over 2L, and they're numbered by integers n. Well, reality is never as, as, as kind or as, as simple as that. What, what actually happens, of course, is, is even if you just had air in the cavity, or, or if you have a, a reflection off a mirror, even metal mirrors have a small wavelength-dependent um, reflectivity. Air, I should tell you, is, you know, uh, there's interesting number. Roy showed some nice examples of what happens if you propagate a femtosecond pulse through glass medium. What does dispersion do? It spreads the pulse. Well, for a number to keep in your mind is that for, for about, um, for a 10 femtosecond pulse, if you wanted to have a 10 femtosecond pulse circulating in this cavity, and if all that was in there was air, a meter of air is about the same as a millimeter of fused silica for 10 femtosecond pulse. So, so even air is dispersive when the bandwidths start to get significant. So in a real cavity, and I, I call that a cold cavity, this thing is still, let's imagine, it's not oscillating. In a real cold cavity, the modes are, on one side, might be a little bit closer together, and on the other side might be a little bit further apart. Actually, it's, yeah, here you see they're, they're a little bit closer than the ideal modes. Here they're a little bit further apart, OK? So, so that's the effect of dispersion in a cavity. And dispersion ultimately limits how, oops, uh oh, I think that I just paused it. Yeah. Dispersion ultimately limits how broad of a bandwidth of a frequency comb we can have. So, so here I just note what I said in words. Due to dispersion, cavity modes are not evenly spaced. However, this phase modulation can provide the required synchronization of the modes. When the laser is operating, this phase modu modulation can counteract the dispersion at some level. And, and in fact, that is a, a soliton-like effect in this cavity. You have dispersion in the cavity that's tending to push the, the pulse, of, stretch the pulse apart. The red is going ahead of the blue, for example. Then the, the nonlinear phase modulation can pull the colors back together. This yields, in the end, a strictly uniform comb that's spaced by not C, but the group velocity of the light, the average group velocity of light, divided by uh, twice the length. This, this effect is something that's really interesting, and I just make a comment about it. We heard a little bit about it in Roy's bar talk um, a few nights ago, is that this, this guy named Wilson Sibbett, maybe you remember he mentioned him. Wilson Sibbett kind of stumbled upon this effect, and it almost seemed magical. In fact, he called it initially magic mode locking, because the, 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 the fact that you could have cavity and just a cur medium in there, and you could get short pulses out of it, it just happened for free. And I, I have to say that this is one of those cases in physics where the physics all works together. The nonlinear optics all works together to give you this beautiful system. 
And you have to adjust the, the cavity just right. But once you've done that, it, it happens for free. And this is really magic. And now we understand all the details of that. But it was when it was first discovered around 1990, this was really a spectacular thing. I, I just make, make one other comment is that the, the, the aspect of the, the cell phase modulation, in fact, it requires, it forces that beta 2 and all higher orders of dispersion are compensated within the bandwidth. And what that means is that you really have a pulse, just like I showed in the, in the movie, that is circulating in the cavity. And every round trip, it's an exact replica of itself, or at least its envelope is an exact replica. And only the, the, the phase evolves or advances underneath that envelope. If, if we had beta 2 or beta 3 uncompensated in the cavity, the pulse would, would spread. And over time, it would rip itself apart. And you wouldn't have a pure soliton-like feature circulating in this cavity. You would have, you know, after a few round trips, the pulse would tear itself apart, and you wouldn't have anything in the cavity any longer. So, so there's this wonderful interaction between the nonlinearity and the dispersion in the cavity that gives you this, this strictly uniformly spaced frequency clock. OK, so, so, so there, there's kind of the, the time and frequency domain picture. Let's come back to this gear picture and see if we can understand what's going on there in terms of you know, what I just explained to you about the actual optical waves in the cavity. Okay? So, so first of all, let's, let's, you know, this, is a, this is gears. Gears are about synthesis. So how do we understand this optical synthesizer, which is really a frequency comb? So, so that frequency comb, and, and I don't think I'll spend a lot of time on here, but, but the frequency comb, just like a set of gears, we can have which gear is turning and which is the output, OK? Which is the input and the output. On this device, we can have an optical input, OK? One, the little wheel up at top can be spinning real fast, and it gets divided down to a much slower frequency at the bottom, right? But we can also put in frequencies on the, on the low frequency side and run it in reverse, OK? The gears are, are fully reversible. So we can feed it with the microwave or the, or the offset frequency, and we can multiply up. Okay, and then, the, and then the output is a little fast spinning wheel. So that's, that's what I try to explain here is that we can have either optical or microwave on the input. And on the, just likewise on the output, we can have a microwave output. If we start with optical, we divide down to microwave. If we start with, with microwave, we multiply up to optical. If we start with optical, we can also generate other optical frequencies, right? I mean, that's... The, the one concept you should have is that the bandwidth is enormous in the optical domain. Okay, from it's, it's 500 terahertz or a petahertz, so the bandwidth is as broad as the carrier itself. So the, but a frequency comb allows us to bridge from the red to the green to the blue to the infrared. Okay, so, so we can have optical in and optical out. And, and here is just simple math. You could rearrange the, the, there's only one formula you need to know in this business. That's that one I, I presented a few slides back, n f rep plus f0. And from, from that, and a little bit of algebra, you can, you can derive how this synthesizer can work. So, so many of you in the lab probably have electronic synthesizer. It's a box, right? You, some company made that. There's a bunch of electronics in it. You don't really care what's in there. But what you know is that if you plug into the back of that a, a 10 megahertz signal, or if there's a quartz crystal providing the reference in the back, right? And then you punch in on the front panel, I want 157.3421 megahertz, blah. Here it comes out, OK? So, so what a frequency comb can be is, is that exact same functionality, but for the optical domain, OK? So, so how, do we, how do we make that work? Well, that comes down to controlling measuring and controlling these degrees of freedom of the frequency comb. So we have the offset frequency and the repetition rate. And here, here I told you is the, the only equation you need to know. So that's an easy test question if you got that one. OK, so, so, so how do we get these? OK, so F0 is, is the new one, the one that I told you that was largely overlooked or perhaps just not accessible for like two or three decades of mode lock lasers, OK? F0, we measure by self-referencing, or what's called self-referencing. 
And I'll show you in detail what that is, but we need a very broad spectrum, an octave, okay? And if we we're going to easily measure F0. F rep is F sub R, sometimes I call it F rep. The, the rate at which pulses circulate in this cavity, that's usually a microwave frequency, and you can easily measure that. You get a photo detector, and you see the rate at which the pulses come out, and we can, we can measure that, and we can control it either with a microwave source, or I'll show you how we can control it with a CW laser as well. And <laughs> sometimes we forget about that. That's just an integer, but we have to know that as well if we're going to synthesize. Usually we determine that with lower resolution measurement or some kind of lookup table, if you would. But I, I won't spend a lot of time on that, but it is, an, it's, it is important. You've got to know this integer. So, so here's another picture of this frequency comb. You, you saw a little bit of that on a, on a slide earlier. So let's see how, how do we get these gears to connect, okay? That's what I want to try to explain to you in this slide here. Okay, so I, I like putting the, the comb on, on this axis, okay? There's the different colors of the comb. And then remember, each color of that comb is a wavelength of light coming out, okay? And, and I, I, so on the bottom is time. And I break the axis here because there's a heck of a lot of cycles <laughs> at optical frequency, right? So if, I wanna, if each one of these is about two femtoseconds, okay, then if I want to go on for a second, there's a quadrillion of them. I've got to stop it at some point. Even if I want to go for a nanosecond, there's, there's 100,000 of them or something like that, or a million of them. Okay, so, so each one of these we label with a mode, N, M plus 1, and each frequency is, is N, F rep plus F0, okay? So the, the first thing we always do is try to get a hold of this offset frequency, F0. And how do we do that? Well, that's where this very broad spectrum is required. We need a spectrum that, that spans from red to blue, an octave, so that we can do a nonlinear step, okay? So, so nonlinear optics, second harmonic generation is very important here. We take some of the light on the red side, and we frequency double, and we interfere with light on the blue side. And I'll show you the math in just a second as to how that gives F0, but just trust me for the moment. If you, if you can do this, and we, we call this step self-referencing, and this is, this is a nonlinear interferometer. You see, we, we take light, and in one arm of the interferometer is a nonlinear optics, is a second harmonic process. So we like to call that a nonlinear interferometer. The output of that gives F0. Okay, now, in the, in the, to control the rest of the comb, there's, there's two ways we can do it. I'm going to explain how we make a clock. So, so I told you that early on is that the, the, the way of the future is to go to optical domain and have your oscillator be a laser, okay? So this laser is ultimately, its frequency is ultimately controlled by a very narrow line width optical transition, okay? So let's start there, and, and, and maybe it isn't, quite fair, I had to put it at the bottom, but I had to kind of lay things out here in some way. What we do then is we take a CW laser, and let's imagine this laser is the one that is, that is controlled by an atomic frequency. Pick your, pick your atom, ytterbium, calcium, aluminum. We then interfere that laser with the frequency cone, okay? So this, this is how we get the gears to go together, all right? So I try to explain that to you. We interfere it, and we make an adjustment to the laser frequency comb so that one mode of the comb is, marches in phase with that reference frequency. I call it nu zero, okay? And how do you do that? Well, what, it's pretty simple how you do it. You actually just change the length of the laser cavity. It changes this frequency a little bit, and we line it up exactly with this. And if we can make it march in lockstep, like two soldiers marching along, we call that a, a phase lock. The phase of this wave is locked to the phase of that wave, okay? And when the phase is locked, the frequency is also locked. Now, something that I, I didn't, I swept under the rug a little bit, but that's in a mode locked laser, all of these modes are automatically locked in phase. So if we can grab control of one of them, we got control of all of them, okay? So, so we use Wilson Sibbett's magic mode locking to solve that problem for us, okay? So once we grabbed a hold of this one, all of these guys are controlled. And then the superposition of all of those modes gives a short pulse each round trip, okay? 
So now that, that is the pulsed output of the laser. And here I drew it with the offset frequency equals zero. So every pulse is identical. But this is then the, the, the microwave countable output. So I just showed you how we go, we, we get a hold of F0, we go from an optical reference through the comb to the countable microwave. And, and in this case, the, the time spacing, or one on the F rep, is just an integer divided by the, by the optical frequency. Or maybe you want to say it the other way, is that F rep is the optical frequency divided by M. So that, that's exactly what a gear does, right? It takes a high frequency, it divides it to a low one. This, this process is, is fully reversible. So we can go the other way as well. We can start up here, and we can give optical frequencies out that are referenced to the microwave. So, so does that, is that clear? That's, that's my, I, I've thought about it a long time. It's my, maybe it's not a good picture. It's my best picture of how I can explain how those gears work, okay? So, th so this step here, self-referencing, let's talk about that a bit, okay? Turns out it's very important, and it, it relates directly to what Roy was talking about, of generating very broad spectra. If, here's another picture of, of the comb. So we, we, we generate a spectrum, and, and here I drew it a different way. As these, these dashed lines are perfect harmonics of the repetition rate. You see there's, they come down to zero. There's an exact, there would be an exact imaginary line there at zero. But the actual comb lines are offset a little bit from those harmonics. So it's, here's, here's the offset frequency there. How do we determine it? If we, if we take a comb line on the low frequency side, frequency double, and then we take a comb line on the high frequency side and we subtract it. And, and what is that subtraction? It's just this heterodyne that I showed you earlier. We just take two optical waves, we combine them, they beat together. So, so you can hear the offset frequency then once you've gone to this step. This is, this is just a symbol for a photodiode, okay? And if you do the math, you see that you get, you get this expression times two, so we have two F zeros here. On this side, we only have one F zero. So two minus one, it gives you F zero, okay? And, and that's why this, this nonlinear step is important. This, you have N here, you have two N here. Those go away if you have the, the, the relationship that you have an octave. Then n is twice n here. You multiply by two, and it, it also goes away. So you're left with f0, OK? So that, that's the key to finally getting a hold of this last missing piece, the offset frequency. The main requirement, a very broad spectrum. How do we get a broad spectrum? Well, you heard about that already. So I'll go th through this kind of quickly. There's, you know, there's, there's a couple different ways to do that. Start with narrow band femtosecond laser, use nonlinear broadening. Okay, there, there's some advantages. It's very easy now to get all kinds of different fibers. You know, you heard the beautiful talk of, of Philip, the, the great talk of Roy, describing the way dispersion can be engineered and the modes and the nonlinearity, effective nonlinearity of these fibers can be, can be made. And, and so you can buy these things in some cases or have good friends who, who will loan them to you and you can do this at 800 nanometers at 1.5 microns almost any frequency across the, the visible near infrared. Some of the disadvantages at least for these microstructured fibers is that you got you got to overcome technical details you know and these these were challenges that were harder early on you know it's a one, one micron core you got to get light into and and now I don't see the guy who asked me, is this stuff for real? Well, if you want this thing to run for a day or a week or a month, you've got to overcome that problem. Fortunately, now people know how to splice the fibers together, or you build an all erbium system, all fiber system, where everything is spliced together. That solves some of the problem. Th this problem Roy alluded to, excess noise. You've got to be careful with how you make this octave. And if you aren't careful, you get complete crap. I agree. Exactly. In fact, I'll tell you a story about um, how we were fortunate enough to not get complete crap, and the competitors got complete crap, and we beat them. <laughs> so <laughs> um, I'll get to that in just a second. 
Another way to get an octave is to, to get it directly from the laser, you know? And there's, there's advantages. There's no excess fiber noise. You don't have to worry about some of these things. The, the problem is there's, there's, you can count on two or three fingers the number of lasers that give you directly an octave, okay? And we've made a few of those. I'll show you one of those. But it's maybe, in the end, it's not the most practical laser. It, it works really great in the lab, but for, for making clocks, you know, it's not going to fly in a satellite, let's say. So, okay, enter, you saw this just a few slides ago, enter the microstructure fiber, how to get very broad spectrum, all right? This beautiful introduction of the, the you know, feeding off the work of Philip Russell, these guys at Bell Labs were able to make this kind of, of microstructured fiber that you could launch, you know, 800 nanometer light into and you got all these beautiful colors of the rainbow. And why does that work? Well, you have the combined enhancement of the intensity. It's a very, this is just the defect where the light is trapped. This is just a micron or so in diameter. So you get huge intensity. And you have the dispersion control of the, due to the arrangement of this, this photonic structure where you can shift the, the, zero, the anomalous dispersion from, you know, at, at this would, Normally this, okay, and these are different units. This is the, the physicist units. So up here is, is normal dispersion. You can bring it down at 800 nanometers to where it's anomalous dispersion in, in this region. So that was, that was a huge benefit. And maybe that's a, a, a good point to tell you the story, is that this fiber, so, so we first saw this result. I was a postdoc working with John Hall, and we we knew enough about the frequency comb and the mode lock laser, as I described to you up to this point, that we were like, okay, we got to figure out how to get an octave of bandwidth. And, and this guy, Janendra Ranka, gave a talk at the Clio meeting in Baltimore in 1999, and he showed these results. And I was in the audience, and my colleague David Jones and John Hall were there. And immediately after the talk, we went up to him and we said, we got to get a piece of this. And he said, oh, well, okay, yeah, he, he's a scientist. Yeah, I'd love to collaborate. And, but then he went back and, you know, Bell Labs, Lucent, it was kind of a sad story, right? It's in the waning days of the great Bell Labs, and maybe they talked to the lawyers. I don't know. The lawyers like, hey, wait, wait, wait. You know, don't just give the stuff away. So there was some long negotiation back and forth for about um, from May until October. Finally, the, the, the Lucent lawyers agreed to... to give a, a piece of that fiber to us at NIST. They wouldn't give it to Hench's group at, at the Max Planck. And Hench ended up going to Philip Russell. And Philip made him, and Jonathan Knight at, at Bath University made him a fiber that, that Hench's group used. But this fiber, I, I just want to say it, this, this spectrum, as, as Roy already alluded to, was complete crap for metrology. That was useless for us. So we had to learn how to use that in a way that we could make, make um, coherent supercontinuum. But um, I'd, I'd have to say that we got that fiber on like, this was a case of, sometimes maybe you've heard of Murphy's Law. Does it, everyone know what Murphy's Law is? If something's gonna go bad, it will go bad. Well, in this case, it was anti-Murphy's Law. It's one of the few times in my life I think I experienced that. If something is gonna go good, it's gonna go good. <laughs> and. We got this fiber like the beginning of October, and literally two or three days later, we had it in the Thai Sapphire laser, and we had the first self-reference comb. It, it worked just perfectly. The reason it worked well for us is we drove that fiber with 20 femtosecond pulses from a Thai Sapphire laser. The guys in Munich, they had a much longer pulse laser, 150 femtoseconds or longer. They drove it. They, they could create continuum that looked like this, very broad but it was incoherent for, for, for these modulation instability reasons that Roy mentioned. So, so in the end, it, it mattered. I mean, it was all a wash, you know. In the end, it's just weeks of difference. But, but um, it's interesting that that one feature allowed us to kind of speed ahead. We had a short pulse laser. We didn't really know it at that time, but it just worked better than the long pulses where this mo these modulation instability effects can build up and can ruin the coherence. So, so here's, here's kind of a gallery of, of a few different lasers that we used early on and continue to use and the types of, of spectra that can be obtained from those. So we, we, we still use this 
gigahertz ring Ty sapphire laser uh, introduced to me by a colleague Albrecht Bartels who is in Constance Germany now and you know a, a simpler a more robust you know fieldable type system is these all spliced erbium fiber lasers okay and my colleague Nate Newbury at, at NIST has really pushed on that hard and has really advanced that and I'll show you a, a slide of his nice work but these are the kind of spectra we can get for different systems. What, here, this laser, you can run it so it produces the octave directly. That's this kind of gray spectrum there. And in fact, that's, that's, we still run that in the lab for laboratory experiments. If you take one of these lasers and run it in a narrow band mode, you can make spectra like this blue. We can make red spectra if we pump it ytterbium, nonlinear fibers, and the green is what we get from, say, erbium-based systems. So all of those are, are Coherent spectra, you can see here, look at these, these Raman solitons out here. All of them have these very, anytime we go through the nonlinear fiber, it's exactly what Roy was telling you. Here's a picture of, you know, what this nonlinear interferometer looks like. Very simple case. There's, there's many different geometries, but I just wanted to show you, you know, if, if you were to go in the lab and lay it out, what would it look like? You would, you would take the laser, you go through some nonlinear fiber and then you split the infrared and the visible. In this case, this might be one micron and 500 nanometers. Frequency double and then we recombine and we go on to a photodetector. And if you look out the photodetector, what you get are um, a signal that looks like this. And, and let me explain this is that, first of all, there, there is some of the FREP signal still remaining there. So, so you see these FREP harmonics here, this laser was running at about 150 megahertz, but it's these little beats in between, which is F0 and FREP minus F0. So, so maybe one way to think of that, and, and in fact it's the reality is, as I drew it before, I showed you that we would say double one line of the cone. Actually, you don't do that. You double a, a group of lines, okay? And you take that group of lines from the red side of the spectrum, you frequency double, and it overlaps, on the, the comb on the green side, okay? And so it's, it's the offset between my fingers here, okay? That actually produces the signal. So when you have this offset, you get, you get always pairs of beats. You get this one beating with one up and this one beating with one down, okay? And then if you, if you took away one comb, you also get the FREP harmonic. So these guys always come in pairs. So that, that's what the signal looks like. We can control that signal by feeding back to, to some actuator on the, on the laser itself. Usually we change the laser power. That changes the nonlinearity inside the laser cavity a little bit, and it moves that F0 around. And then we could choose. We, we could choose to move it all the way to zero. We could lock it there. But usually we, we would choose to fix it at a, at a radio frequency. There's just a, a few more pictures. You saw that picture already. That was the, the, the 10 gigahertz Thai sapphire. Here shows this octave spanning spectrum. And you know, you, you can't see it on this spectral resolution, but inside there at a gigahertz rate is, are all these comb teeth. This is, I, this is Tara Fortier is a colleague of mine who has really perfected this. And this is really a nice laser. Thai sapphire, it's sometimes people have called that God's gift to laser science. It's, it's really such a nice material. And you can pump it hard, it gives lots of power, it doesn't damage, and these lasers are really low noise. The, the only problem is, is this source here is kind of expensive. The green photons are not cheap. So, and, and it's a good laboratory tool. Other examples are, are erbium fiber lasers. I won't go into many details here, but these are lasers that are, are constructed you know, with a piece of erbium dope fiber and splice to standard single mode fiber. Some of the lasers that operate on the nonlinear polarization rotation, you have to have some polarization elements in there. Others I'll show you in, in just a minute don't require that. They could be all polarization maintaining fiber or very robust. Here's an example of if you take the output of this laser, so here would come the output off a polarizing, polarizing selective element, you amplify it and you go into these nonlinear fibers, you get something like this. My, my colleague Nate Newbury has developed versions of this that are all linear fiber integrated. So it's a polarization maintaining erbium fiber laser comb. 
It's a little bit hard if you wanted to read about it in, in this paper here. The, the point I'd like to make about this is, is you know, one, one tough thing about optical fibers is they're birefringent in general. And so you build a laser with an optical fiber in it and you go and touch the fiber and the behavior of the laser changes. Just because you put a little stress, rotates the polarization, it usually will change the, the output of the laser. It's particularly true for, for mode-locked fiber lasers. This kind of laser is built with a, with a polarization maintaining fiber that has high stress or high birefringence built into it. So if you can get the light on one of the axes, it stays on that axis. And it's much less sensitive to any kind of environmental perturbations. So, so Nate and his colleagues put this laser in the back of a van. And maybe you remember from my picture in the, in the early talk is NIST is right on the side of the mountains. And there's a road up there. And he could drive the van up the mountain with the laser running. And these are just the, the kind of detailed technical signals that shows that it's running, it's locked. Nate is now running these lasers for months at a time, you know, completely counting every optical cycle over a month. So I think this is, the technology is for real. And, um, you know, there's still some things that one would want better with it, but it's, it's really exciting to see it at that point. Another system that, that we work a lot with are, are Euterbium fiber systems. This, is, this isn't our work, but it's an example from group at IMRA and um, some colleagues at the University of Colorado. The, the thing that's nice about euterbium is that you have tremendous gain in euterbium doped fibers. So um, you might have a, a, the laser oscillator here, and this is all fiber with fiber brag gratings providing the feedback and some sort of a saturable absorber at the end to, to help um, with the mode locking. But the interesting thing here is you can amplify these up to 80 watts and even at these high powers, it can support kind of subhertz line widths for the, for the comb teeth. Just mention here that, that we have a lot of interest in extending frequency combs via nonlinear optics. So, so you saw in the previous plot that I showed that you can kind of, you know, using nonlinear fibers, you can fill up maybe from 400 nanometers to 2,000 or 2,500 nanometers. So that's a, that's a lot of bandwidth. It's a very useful part of the, the optical spectrum. But what if you wanted to do more, okay? For example, what if you wanted to make frequency combs in the ultraviolet? Well, my, my colleague Jun Yi at uh, Jilin University of Colorado is, is taking that 80 watt laser you saw on the previous slide and, and frequency not just doubling, tripling, quadrupling. He's, I think he's up to you know, somewhere around the 17th harmonic he can generate, and thereby can make frequency combs in the extreme ultraviolet. And that's interesting for doing, um, maybe it's interesting for next generation clocks. You remember I mentioned that if clocks are going to get better, they're going to have to go to higher frequencies. So precision spectroscopy or experiments you would want to do at shorter and shorter wavelengths would benefit from this harmonic generation. The other one we're very interested in is difference frequency generation. So let's take any two components. So, so here I just kind of show schematically, you know, if Thai sapphire, if euterbium and erbium kind of color, cover this range. What if we took two components out of here and we took the difference of them? That takes us to, to longer wavelengths or lower frequencies. And that's a, that's a route to get frequency combs out to the, to the mid-infrared and even the long-wave infrared or even terahertz range. So that's something that we think is quite interesting, maybe not for clocks, but for applications in spectroscopy and sensing, where we can use the teeth of these comb, kind of like a million little laser probes, to look at the, the complex rotations, vibrations, oscillations of molecules. OK. so. I think that, actually, that timing is pretty good. So that, I think that's where I'll stop today. So when we pick it up tomorrow, so I, I think I've, I've covered a lot of background. I told you about counting cycles of light. And tomorrow, we'll talk about our work on you know, taking lab scale devices and learning how to make them. Can we bring them down to chip scale? And then I'll delve more into some applications. So be happy to answer any questions. or. It's always dangerous to stand between a group of students and their lunch. <laughs> so if you want to go have lunch, that's good too. OK, thank you.
Yeah.